I really wanted to thank Daphne and of course Jennifer and Julie for inviting me to participate today and as I was thinking about how my work would best fit in with the panel I thought well we have two people who do such exciting active work I guess because people do activist work in the courts and then somebody David who's hopefully going to be here shortly has a really interesting project on the details and the inside workings of the IRB. So my perspective is that of a comparative political scientist and also somebody who's in law and society. So what I wanted to contribute was that I wanted to step back from the conversation a little bit and put Canada in perspective. And I hope that the perspective will be a little bit provocative because I wanted to just um, knock down Canada a little bit from its pedestal and um, talk a little bit about the shift that has taken place in Canada. And I have the screen behind me and I have my printouts here and hopefully I won't get too confused. So I wanted to, um, talk about why Canada is such a frequent model but also in comparative perspective really an outsider compared to other countries and then how this has really changed over time and then tell you a little bit about an article that I have written recently that um, came out of a workshop where I was asked to think about how Europe might have inspired Canadian public policy making and I was initially thinking well I hope that um, Europe has not inspired Canadian immigration and refugee policy making too much but as I was thinking about this in the context of what I then was comparing I thought well I think one could argue that there are some lessons that um, we could talk about that Canada has gained from having looked at the shopping list of other countries and one could of course make the same case about Australia, about Britain, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of examples that I think are clearly inspired from Europe and um, compare them with Canada and then talk about perhaps some differences in terms of rights mobilization and what can be done about that. And I might be out of time, so I guess I will get hopefully timed on that one. So first let's talk about the highlights of Canada. As most of you in the room are familiar with the wonderful image of Canada, it won the 1986 Hansen Medal. It, um, some of you may also know, amongst advanced industrialized countries, has the highest Geneva Convention recognition rate. Historically speaking, sometimes it's peaked at 50%, sometimes it's been at 30%. The last figures are also fairly high, of course, that is because it's really hard to get into Canada at the moment. But again, if you wanted to celebrate Canada as an outlier, um, the numbers just for the Geneva Convention recognition rate alone are very high. The European average is 20%. So again, just to give you a little bit of a sense of the outlier status of Canada, that's really what Canada has celebrated in the past. What it has also celebrated is that it has a large overseas resettlement program. Actually, if you look at the size of the population compared to the size of people coming, it's really an extraordinarily active program. Of course, again, if you know Lately, not so many people have been coming, but we're still in the celebratory side of things. Um, traditionally, Canada is also known as a leader in policy development, and this is again um, something that a lot of you might know. The gender-based persecution guidelines from the 1990s are always the shining example of why Canada is perceived to be a leader and an outlier at the same time. Um, but then there's of course also that legacy of humanitarianism that a lot of you might also be familiar with. Canada has selectively over the decades taken in large numbers of refugees from certain trouble zones around the world. We can go back to Hungary in the 1950s, to Vietnam, um, more recently Kosovo. But what's important to remember about that celebration, and I'll get to that in a second, that that is really a discretionary decision. And it is really also reflecting a history of discretionary picking and choosing who the right refugees are and it's not really coming out of an understanding and a commitment I would argue to a rights consciousness and a commitment to refugees having rights. So that's just something I want to return to in a few minutes. There's also what some of my colleagues have looked at. There used to be this protectionist mindset amongst the bureaucrats. And in the US context, that always gets confusing. People understand protectionism differently. But I just mean the understanding that refugees are worthy of protection, that it's important that they get resettled and that they come to another country because they really have genuine reasons why they need to flee their country of origin. That mindset has historically existed in Canada. And as we'll see in a minute, um, a number of my colleagues who've done interviews would argue that that has fundamentally changed. But again, this is the Canada that we often are proud of, that we refer to, that we would still like to be. But I don't think, together with a number of other people, that that is still, that is who we are now. <laughs> 
Um, but before we go to some of the policy changes that you are probably more familiar with, let's just look at some of the details of the past, um, because I think it's important to, I like history, so I just wanted to pull out a few things for you. Um, Canada did actually not accede, accede, the word I can't pronounce, to the Geneva Convention and the Protocol until 1969. So if you think about 1951, 1967, as some of the markers, that's actually pretty late in the game. And the bureaucratic structures that then allowed refugees to be, where their, where their cases were being considered, that was all done in a paper-based format. There was no interview. Um, it wasn't really what we are known, um, what we know today. It wasn't really this quasi-judicial, this largest quasi-judicial tribunal until 1989. And as again, a lot of you will know, not until the Supreme Court of Canada in 1985 said, well, Canada, you must do this. But then if we get into the details again, well, you might then want to say that these people have no money. You might want to give legal aid. Well hardly any legal aid, limited legal aid, and there was some in the 1990s, but again, if you have this commitment, maybe the money should match the commitment. But then also from this other little, this is just a little pet peeve of mine, I keep talking to my students about how there has not been an appeal on the facts in Canada until 2012, 2013. And all of my students say, well, but all this talk about rights and appeal and courts is like all over the newspaper. But if you get really nerdy technical, there has just not been an appeal. There have been all these other hurdles to get to the courts. And again, for the nerdy people in the room, you know there's, there's a application to apply for, you have to request to ask the federal court that you can present your case. That has to be granted. The case is judicial review. It's not a full-fledged appeal on the basis of the facts of the case. There's also this thing called a certification of the question. If you want to go up in the judicial chain, that was introduced to make it harder for cases to rise through the judiciary. And then, of course, there's the Supreme Court that has its own leave process, but that's not unique to refugee cases. So there are a bunch of hurdles just in the procedural chain that really make it hard to talk about a commitment to rights. But the Refugee Appeal Division that was just implemented is actually one that um, hopefully I will be able to get back to at the very end. <laughs> but just this delay from the initial commitment in 2002 that there would be an appeal on the facts and the fact that it took 10 years for the Refugee Appeal um, Division to actually come online and the huge controversy around that time also tells you something about Canada's commitment to rights because if you're committed to rights then you might want to allow disagreement and you might want to allow appeal options and for that to be fully considered. Um, then I have um, in one of my pieces talked about the rise of efficiency and its connection to rights. I would argue that over time historically um, there was a twinning of justice and effectiveness. An effective procedure was one that was just and that changed at some point. And if you look at just the media coverage of this, at some point the IRB was not um, fair and efficient anymore but it was problematic. Um, Jeffrey Simpson, in one of um, his famous titles, wrote, the Supreme Court has gummed up the refugee process. So at some point there's this change where it seems like the IRB is celebrated and then something else happens. And then if we had time to go into the details, all these efficiency words about fairness is no longer as relevant as efficiency and speed. And that really is something that tends to dominate the process and justice and rights seem to just be a problem. Some of you, um, but this is all before the changes that were undertaken by the current government. This is one of my favorite charts from a Maitri report and an evaluation, and I know it's really tiny and people are squinting, but there is a Maitri 2012 report, and I just love the graphics. So all of the boxes in there are changes that the government made to various pieces related to immigration. It's not all refugee stuff. Citizenship is in there. Various other um, immigration parts are in there, but I just love it because it shows, man, they've really almost tackled just anything you can possibly think of. So this is where we just need to talk about, well, what has been happening and then how can we explain what has been happening? Two big explanations as to what has been happening might be familiar to both of you. One is that Canada has moved from has moved from has moved from being an outlier and a model 
to just basically a country that is now getting in line in a number of respects with other advanced industrialized societies. The first getting in line argument is the typical neoliberal, well, if it's all about battles of the brains, then we need to try to keep people out that do not fit that discourse of who is the best and the brightest and who cannot make it. So that is one classic explanation of why refugee policy has become squeezed and why rights are not so important anymore. But I would say that that's really important, but it does not explain the precise policy choices and also some of the changes that have taken place um, that I hopefully will have time to talk about. Um, the second other classic explanation that most of you um, will be familiar with is that refugee policy has gotten sucked into another vortex and that is securitization um, that has been going on since the 1990s. It's not something that started with 9-11, but um, some of the highlights of that are that in bureaucratic circles, and my colleague Sandy Irvine has done work on this, it seemed that Canada was perceived as a security laggard, its refugee policy was perceived as too liberal, and a lot of pressure in international meetings um, from the US and the European colleagues was exerted on getting the minds of bureaucrats and politicians to change. Um, the change in political, but more importantly also public opinion, has also been studied, and we were just talking about this because if you read some of the newspaper replies to some of the news on the refugee healthcare cuts, they're fairly evil if you are pro-refugee healthcare, and um, some of my colleagues who have studied this have also said that yes, the perception of the public on refugees and rights has also shifted very much away from this protectionist view to this other kind of view. So that is also reflected in some of the empirical research that has been undertaken. But what still is interesting is that if we have this big paradigm shift, then what explains the big gap in the timing? Why are all these changes emerging now? We could talk about some specific other ones. And then what is going on with rights and courts? Are they driving this change? What is the role of um, rights talk and again of courts in this process? Here I wanted to talk just very briefly about um, one of my latest publications that is based on a European argument where rights and courts are very central to understanding how refugee policy in Europe has been made. And if you're not familiar with this argument, um, let me just tell you what the basic um, spin here is. The basic argument is that refugees, through having gone to court and through rights protections in constitutions at the domestic level, have become so, I guess, important and influential that governments were not able or did not feel able to control their migration policy goals sufficiently anymore. And therefore, they have shifted their policy venues, so the places where they make public policy, up to the EU level and then out to private actors, and this would all be the stuff of airport screening and airlines that you might be familiar with, and then of course also downwards to the local level. Um, so there are local um, police officers that also are much more engaged in some countries in immigration control. That's called the venue shifting model in the European conversation. That has not been um, something that has been applied to Canada, and this is something that I've recently done in a publication that came out of this workshop where I was asked to look at Europe and Canada together. And I just wanted to give you um, a couple of examples, if I still have yeah, the five minute gets no, no, moved, but I'm... No, 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 that wasn't to be <coughs> you, actually. Okay, all right. Oh, sorry, I was just um, got 10. Okay, that's even better. So what's really interesting um, also just for the comparativists in the room is that I will just pull out a couple of obvious policy similarities, but I wanted to really talk about the institutional differences and then the differences for rights mobilization and again, involvement of the courts, because it really seems like um, some of the examples are the same, but if you look at the long-term unintended consequences of some of the policies in Europe, um, there are, of course, as some of you may know, the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights and also the EU Parliament. There are three actors that um, governments in Europe have tried very hard to keep out of immigration policy and out of refugee policy. So if we had lots of time to talk about this, there is a 
long, slow, creeping, increasing involvement of all of these three actors. And that is not something that I bet you the initial creators of the Europeanization of immigration and refugee policy had in mind, because it was really about controlling policy choices. So I think that's an interesting explanation. But something has been happening, and this is really something that we can only um, observe over time. In the Canadian case, I would argue that some of this shifting up has also been happening. I don't have time to talk about the private actor business and the, the local actors, but I just wanted to talk about two of the examples of this upshifting process. They are, I'm sure, familiar with uh, to you if you have heard of the um, Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement that I think sounded very much like the Dublin Agreement in Europe to me, so that's why I called that little section from Dublin with love in my, in my article, um, and because I'm a James Bond fan, so I thought that was kind of appropriate. <laughs> um, but then there are also these so-called safe countries of origins that, uh, again, the German in me is very familiar with because they've been debated before the Ger German Federal Constitutional Court. So that also smelled a lot like Europe, and I was really intrigued in understanding the differences and similarities. But I would also argue that the um, healthcare, the refugee healthcare cuts are also something that is inspired by countries that have used social benefits as, or the lack of social benefits, or the structuring of social benefits as a deterrent for hopefully preventing people from coming. So I've just added that one to the shopping list. And if we weren't talking about refugees, then we could, of co course, also talk about the explosion of the temporary worker um, stream in Canada, because that's also something that, of course, Europeans are very familiar with. But again, I'm not saying it's causally necessarily from there. I think there are just some, some strange similarities. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention how um, Dublin and the Canada Safe Third Country Agreement work and how they differ, because I thought that that was interesting. And then also I will briefly just talk about the Safe Third Country stuff and then I hopefully am still in good time. So the basic philosophy of the Dublin Agreement that has been around since the 1990s, but there are some much older origins in Switzerland in 1986, was that refugees are not allowed to go to a country where they want to live, the assumption is that, well, they're asking for asylum, so therefore, of course, the first country that is safe, that's really where they should be making their claim for asylum. Because again, it's about discretionary granting of refuge, and it's not about you actively choosing where you might want to go, because that's the mindset of you're immigrating, right? So that was entrenched in the Dublin Agreement, and um, if you ask European officials, it's what's partially driving them crazy, because there are actually so many people that remain in orbit that are sent around, because it's really difficult to actually transfer people back, and it's also really difficult to get numbers on these transfers. So some of the um, numbers that I've seen were actually ridiculously low, so I'm suspicious that that may not even be right, but Steve Pierce keeps a log, and it says in, in his data that only 5% of people, and this is um, the most recent data that I could find, were actually transferred. And considering how many people arrive in various other countries, I, I just can't believe that it would be that low, and if it is, that would indeed be shocking, so there is another research project there to find out. But again, what's interesting um, in comparison to the Canada Safe Third Country Agreement that it kind of smells like the same thing, but there are some important differences. So the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement came online, so to speak, in 2004. Um, there is a little bit of data about that, and of course you might want to ask why the US would agree to this, because the way that this of course works is that there are a lot more flights from various countries that go to the United States than to Canada, so it's much more natural that one would arrive in the United States if you were able to come um, on a plane in the first place. So then the question is, have you then um, decided to seek asylum in the US or have you then chosen to move on to Canada? And then if you come via the land border, this is then where this agreement grabs and where you might potentially get sent back to the United States where you're then not allowed to claim refugee status in Canada if that was your intention. It of course also works the other way around, but if you look at the numbers, most of the cases would be ones where people try to get to Canada and then are sent back to the US. What I also found interesting is that um, 
Well, for the data that um, exists, this really affected 32 percent of Canada's inland claims. So if you are talking about a policy that in one shot really affected a huge number of people, I think 32 percent of people at the land border, that's, that's, that's an enormous amount of people that just this one policy change grabbed and affected, yet there are exceptions. And again, the exceptions are interesting because it's, um, you would think if you had family in the country, that would then allow you to still come, but that kind of sounds like immigrating and not like refugee status, right? So having family in either somewhere in Europe or in Canada does indeed grant you an exception from the way that this mechanism works, but the definition of family is much more restrictive in Europe, it's much more expansive in Canada, and 80% of people, this is again the data I was able to find, um, qualify for the exception in Canada. Just in terms of rights and um, justice, some of you may know that the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement was taken to court um, and it's fascinating to read the cases but it's still in existence so the federal court was initially I think interested and did overturn it and then federal court of appeal upheld it. So there was a court challenge although it's so difficult to take cases like this to court because you need to, of course find a person who had tried to cross into the country so this is of course the tricky business about rights and courts and that's of course why it's smart if you're the government to have an agreement like this because if you don't allow people in then makes it harder to appeal. In the um, European process, there have been a number of court rulings because of the various conditions, um, reception conditions in the various countries, the fact that people have been shuttled back and forth so much, especially the conditions in Greece, as some of you um, could imagine, have been really terrible. But there have still been countries that have deported and sent people back to Greece. Um, my own country, Germany, was one of the last ones that also needed to be told by the European Court of Justice, no, you cannot send people back there. So that is one of the differences that there have been many more court rulings, but the agreement is still in place. So that seems to be a difference in the mechanism. And I'll just say a couple of things about the safe country of origin lists. This does not exist at the European level. These lists only exist, yep. These lists only exist at the national level. There have been conversations about having a European-wide list, but this is where disagreements between countries are huge. There have been a number of court challenges on either the list itself or the fact that there are certain countries designated as safe. And we could go through some of them, but I don't have time. In Canada, um, most of you know that Canada has only had this accelerated procedure since uh, 2012. Uh, the list has been heavily debated. There have, as far as I know, not been any court challenges, but it might be interesting to look at some of the European cases to see whether there are any similarities and any arguments that could be made on that front because there is, I think, quite a bit of literature on the European side, but not yet on the North American side. But I have some grad students that are really keen to, to dig into this topic, and they're really concerned about this because, of course, it accelerates the procedure so much, it also takes away rights that that is really the concern, and challenging that and figuring out how to get around that, um, I think, will be really important in the future. And this is really my last. What I hope you have um, heard was somewhat familiar, yet I hope you have thought about Canada as the shining light of refugee policy and what really is it that is changing and is it really that Canada was always such a staunch defender of refugee rights because I think it was always built on a very shaky foundation and that shaky foundation discretionary admissions is rising back to the fourth and um, in the examples that I told you about it's really the power to decide who gets in is strongly going back to the executive and by that I really mean cabinet and it's getting really difficult to get in there I think but I hope that there are opportunities to crack this open and I don't have time to talk about this but I'm happy to hear from people who uh, want to figure out how to tackle this afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you.